Boy, today is a momentous occasion. We're going to so enjoy doing chapter 11 of the book of Isaiah. Now, I say this because not just because Isaiah chapter 11 is really, really cool, but here's something that I'm going to give you a little bit of a background, kind of pull back the curtain, if you will, on these uh, videos that I've been recording. So and, uh, if you've been following our videos religiously, you know, no pun intended, but like you've been watching a lot of these videos that I've been doing, I'm so excited. I'm so glad that you're here. So glad that you are watching these videos. This is uh, the goal, of course, of these videos is to just help make the scriptures more accessible to you. Make it easier to understand the stories and concepts and be able to go from that, just kind of understanding what's there in the scriptures to getting deeper into them. So we just want to get you going so that you want to do more research. You want to study the scriptures more, want to do more with with the scriptures. Uh, so something that's really fascinating about this. Okay, so Isaiah chapter 11 is what we're going to do today. There is a tremendous amount of information in Isaiah chapter 11 about our day and age now. The one thing that makes this extra significant is because we are recording this. So just this might give you a little bit of aha insight into what we're doing. Uh, this video is being recorded on September 21st, 2023. Now you might think, okay, now this video is probably going to be played around December 16th, I think, 2023 is when it's actually going to air on, on uh, YouTube. Uh, so this is probably about the time you're watching this right now. So we, I recorded this September 21st, 2023. Now that's significant because September 21st, 1823, so 200 years to the day prior to the recording of this video, was the day, that evening of the day when Moroni appeared to Joseph Smith in his bedroom. Uh, and so this is really significant because Isaiah chapter 11, the chapter we're going to talk about today in the day of this recording, was quoted to Joseph Smith by Moroni 200 years ago today. So kind of some fun significance, just kind of fun that it all pulled together and did that. So yay, a little fun celebration. So that gives you a little bit of insight. I do try to record these videos in advance. And thanks to the book of Psalms, I was able to get ahead quite a ways so that I could take more time in the book of Isaiah and make sure I do these videos right. So by the time you're watching these, I'm probably back to only making them a week in advance uh, just because Isaiah is a big book and it's going to take some time to get through it. And Jeremiah is not going to be any less of a big book to get through. So be prepared for those ones as well. So, okay, so chapter 11, let's jump in and get into this. Now, as we go into here, there's uh, just some fun significance we're going to talk about. So I'm so looking forward to the comments that you leave on this video as we talk about some really important Latter-day prophecies and Latter-day concepts today. So one thing to understand is there's kind of a sister volume of scripture or sister chapter of scripture that goes along with this. Kind of two, really, because uh, Nephi in the Book of Mormon, 2 second, second Nephi 21, is the chapter when Nephi quotes Isaiah chapter 11. So this is a chapter that gets quoted in the Book of Mormon as well. So we have a different, uh, not a different version of it but sometimes the wording is just a little different in there. So it's fun to compare those two. But also, in the uh, Doctrine and Covenants, section 113 is all about chapter 11 of the book of Isaiah. So when Joseph Smith was going through doing his translations, this, in a way, you could say that half the Doctrine and Covenants is, is because of the Joseph Smith translation of the Bible because those are revelations given to him to teach him and understand new concepts as he went through the, the, the Bible, basically. So section 113 is one of those sections where there was an opportunity where Joseph allowed other people to say, hey, will you ask the Lord these questions? So he got a bunch of questions and he asked God about them. And section 113 is a compilation of a couple of those questions about Isaiah 11. So we'll bring that in today as well to make sure we can understand Isaiah chapter 11 better. So that all being said, there's a lot of fun stuff around this. This is an important chapter to understand uh, in the scripture. So let's get in 
and get started in chapter 11 of Isaiah. Verse 1, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. This is important. So let's look at a couple things really quick. So Jesse, of course, was the father of David. Uh, so this is talking about Davidic genealogy, basically. This is this is a way saying that there's going to be uh, there's going to be basically an important development in ancestry as we move forward. So Jesse, David, and then there was the prophecy given to David that he would his descendants basically would be the savior. The savior would come through his line, basically his lineage. That's what they're talking about here. Uh, in fact, in section 113, if we're to go over there, that's the first question that they ask in section 113 is, who is the stem of Jesse spoken of in the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth verses of the 11th chapter of Isaiah? Verily, thus saith the Lord, it is Christ. That's what they're talking about, basically. And then they ask, so what is this rod that is spoken of in the first verse of the 11th chapter of Isaiah that should come of the stem of Jesse? So he says, Behold, thus saith the Lord, it is a servant in the hands of Christ, who is partly a descendant of Jesse as well as of Ephraim, or of the house of Joseph, on whom there is laid much power. So this is a servant, basically, that rod shall come from the stem of Jesse, the branch shall grow out of its roots. So this is a prophecy of the Savior that will be coming, and a servant who will follow the Savior, like a prophet, who will come forth to do that, of the tribe of Ephraim, that will be there as well. So verse 2, And the Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord, and shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord. And he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears. But with righteousness he shall, shall he judge the poor and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he shall smite the earth with the rod of his mouth and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked." So I'm going to pause there for just a second. So this is a heck of a description of who this person is, basically. So some great things that we get to learn in here uh, about this person. Now, most of this, of course, is about the Savior himself. So I want to give just a little bit more, because you might be thinking, well, wait a minute, you didn't fully answer the question, though, Curtis, of who is this servant in the hands of Christ comes through Ephraim. So let's look at a couple of quotes here. And these are, I have these quotes when we do the Doctrine of Covenants, they'll come back up again. Joseph Fielding Smith summarized Ephraim's role when he wrote, and this is in Doctrines of Salvation, book, volume 3, uh, page 252. He says, It is Ephraim today who holds the priesthood. It is with Ephraim that the Lord has made covenant and has revealed the fullness of the everlasting gospel. It is Ephraim who is building temples and performing the ordinances in them for both the living and for the dead. When the lost tribes come, and it will be a most wonderful sight and a marvelous thing when they do come to Zion, in fulfillment of the promises made through Isaiah and Jeremiah, they will have to receive the crowning blessings from their brother Ephraim, the firstborn in Israel. So Ephraim isn't so much as, he's talking conception, not so much there's one person who's descended through here, but he's talking about how that Ephraim, the tribe of Ephraim, will be basically a, a very important part of the gathering of Israel. Building temples is that. Now, we know that uh, there's an interesting quote that I heard just recently, in fact, uh, and this will be fun because I'm recording this to the week before General Conference. We'll see what happens next week in General Conference. Um, there's an interesting quote. So right now we have, I think, somewhere around 156 temples uh, 160 something temples, I think, in some various stage from announcements all the way through being used. And uh, there was a quote. Oh, I'm trying to remember who the gentleman was that did it. I think it was the area, Utah Area Authority President, President Pearson, I believe, is his name. Uh, I can see his face, and I think it's President Pearson. 
uh, in a talk that he gave just early, like last May, I think, of 2023, uh, he gave a talk in a, a fireside. Uh, so it wasn't necessarily, you know, like a general conference type talk. Uh, but he made a comment in there that um, one day, I guess, President Nelson made the comment to Elder Bednar. He said, hey, Elder Bednar, how many temples do we have? And he says, well, President, you know, you know, run 160 something temples. And uh, 165 temples, I think, is what maybe the number was. Uh, and and uh, he says, well, you know this, President. He says, yes, I do. That's a good start, but we need to 10 times that, which would be 1,500 temples, basically. So that's the goal. If that If that is true, and I haven't been able to completely corroborate that, mainly because the fireside usually isn't recorded and then published, uh, but to, so if you have any information on that fireside or can corroborate that, awesome. Please put that in the comments. But if you don't, the, the thing that's interesting about that is that means we need to 10x the temple construction. A lot of us are looking at this going, man, we're building temples at a breakneck speed already. I mean, in 200 years, we went from no temples to 165 temples. So that's almost a, that we're averaging almost a temple a year for 200 years. Uh, and most of that has only been done in the last 30 years, honestly. Uh, it's amazing to look at how fast temples have accelerated. Uh, but they want to 10x that. So if that's true, we've got a whole lot more temples to be announced and built to uh, get that get that moving more. That's that's amazing to think about. Uh, now Brigham Young had a had a comment about this. This is in Journal of Discourses. Uh, he said uh, President Brigham Young affirmed the place of Ephraim and the prophet Joseph Smith in bringing to pass the purposes of this dispensation. He said it is the house of Israel we are after. We care not whether they come from the east, the west, the north, or the south. From China, Russia, England, California, North or South America, or some other locality, it is the very land on whom Father Jacob laid his hands that will save the house of Israel. The Book of Mormon came to Ephraim, for Joseph Smith was a pure Ephraimite, and the Book of Mormon was revealed to him. While he lived, he made it his business to search for those who believed the gospel. So that's another quote from Brigham Young on there. So this idea is not so much Isaiah saying that that uh, this is a person, but a, like you could say, prophets would fit that person, but this is a people descendant of Ephraim, basically, that will carry the priesthood, carry the gospel to everybody else. So that's what's happening now. So, so chapter Isaiah 11 is very active in the real world today, right now. So let's jump on to verse 5, is where we left off. And righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. So there's some more great things for us to consider. Um, in fact, let's see, where did my notes go? So verse 5, no, so verse 5 is interesting because the girdle of his loins, the faithfulness, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins, the, uh, these are clothing. We're talking about clothing here. So the robes of righteousness, how he can always help us be ready to act and run to us. As we come to the temple, we can encourage peace in this world. More temples and more people temple-worthy will help heal the earth of wickedness and hate. So verse 5 is important to understand that this is temples, temple clothing, clothing of righteousness. So temples are a very important part of what chapter 11 is all about. So this is super, super important to, to learn. Um, so, and when we get the spirit, this is going to help even more in our, in our life. So let me go over a couple more quotes as well that get into Isaiah 11. Also, let's see, where'd they go? There it is. So here's Bruce R. McConkie talking about this branch and idea as well. I want to bring some of these in as we're going along. He said, since it takes a first and a second coming to fulfill many mess messianic prophecies, we of necessity must consider them here. And in the case of the Davidic Messianic utterances, show also how they apply to our Lord's second coming. Christ is the son of David, the seed of David, the inheritor through Mary his mother of the blood and of the great king. He is also called the stem of Jesse and the branch, meaning branch of David. Messianic prophecies under these headings deal with the power and dominion he shall wield 
as he sits on David's throne and have reference almost exclusively to his second sojourn on planet Earth. So what he's saying in here, of course, is that, uh, that the whole idea of this is talking about how Christ will reign in righteousness during the millennium. So this is, this is after the last days, basically. Uh, so we're building to that point, basically. So the prophets are here, like Joseph Smith and others. Ephraim is here to prepare for the coming of the Savior. This is what it's all about. Sorry about that. I had to swipe a thing off my, my camera. Um, <clears throat> so this is the thing for us to consider, is what's going on in our day and age, because this is literally happening now, basically. Uh, so I'm looking forward to your comments and thoughts. How do you feel about realizing that Isaiah 11, which was quoted by Moroni to Joseph Smith, and Nephi found it relevant enough to quote it in his book, in the Book of Mormon too, that we're getting multiple sources come together to say, let us help you understand Isaiah 11 is, Isaiah 11 is key, very key. Uh, so much we can learn from them, okay, on this. This is amazing. Now he continues on here, Jesse was the father of David. Isaiah speaks of the stem of Jesse, whom he also designates as a branch, growing out of the root of that ancient worthy. He recites how the spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him how he shall be mighty in judgment, how he shall smite the earth and slay the wicked, how the lamb and the lion shall lie down together in that day, all of which has reference to the second coming in the millennial era thereby ushered in. As to the identity of the stem of Jesse, the revealed word says, Verily thus saith the Lord, it is Christ. This also means that the branch is Christ, as we shall now see from other related scriptures. So here's some other scriptures here. By the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord foretells the ancient scattering and the latter-day gathering of his chosen Israel. After they have been gathered out of all countries, whither I have driven them, after the kingdom has been restored to Israel, as desired by the ancient apostles in Acts 1-6, then this eventuality, yet future and millennial in nature, shall be fulfilled. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper." and shall execute judgment and justice in the earth. In his days Judah shall be saved, and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is his name, whereby he shall be called the Lord our righteousness. That's Jeremiah 23. That is to say, the king who shall reign personally upon the earth during the millennium shall be the branch who grew out of the house of David. He shall execute judgment and justice in all the earth, because he is the Lord Jehovah, even him whom we call Christ. Now through Zechariah, the Lord spoke similarly, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I will bring forth my servant, the branch. I will remove the iniquity of the land in one day, meaning that the wicked shall be destroyed in the millennial era of peace and righteousness commence. In that day, saith the Lord of hosts, shall ye call every man his neighbor under the vine and under the fig tree. This is Zechariah 3. Of that glorious millennial day, the Lord says also, Behold the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne. That's Zechariah 6. That is the branch of David. That the branch of David is Christ is perfectly clear. We shall now see that he is also called David that he is a new David, an eternal David, who shall reign forever on the throne of his ancient ancestor. It shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that is, in the great millennial day of gathering, that they shall serve the Lord their God, and David their king, whom I will raise up unto them. That's Jeremiah 30. In those days, and at that time, will I cause the branch of righteousness to grow up unto David, and he shall execute judgment and righteousness in the land, in those days shall Judah be saved, and Jerusalem shall dwell safely. And this is the name wherewith, she, they, wherewith he shall be called, the Lord our righteousness, which is to say that because the great king himself reigns in her midst, even the city shall be called after him. So the city is going to be called the Lord of righteousness, just as much as Christ will be called the Lord of righteousness. For thus saith the Lord, David shall never want a man to sit upon the throne of the house of Israel. If ye can break my covenant of the day and my covenant of the night, and that there should not be day and night in their season, 
Then may also my covenant be broken with David my servant, that he should not have a son to reign upon his throne. That's Jeremiah 33. Now that's an interesting quote to realize that basically God is saying, if you can completely stop the solar system and the universe from functioning, break all the laws of physics and completely change everything around, then my covenant can be broken. But until then, it's staying in place. So that's a high bar for breaking the covenant. It's not going anywhere, basically. All right, so David's temporal throne fell long centuries before our Lord was born. And that portion of Israel, which had not been scattered to the ends of the earth, was in bondage to the iron yoke of Rome. But the promises remain. The eternal throne shall be restored in due course with a new David sitting thereon, and he shall reign forever and ever. Though through Ezekiel, the Lord speaks of this one shepherd in this way, I will save my flock, and I will set up one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, even my servant David. He shall feed them, and he shall be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God, and my servant David a prince among them. When that day comes, I will make with them a covenant of peace, the Lord says, meaning they shall have again the fullness of the everlasting gospel. Then there shall be showers of blessing. All Israel shall dwell safely and know that the Lord is their God. That's Ezekiel 34. Here's another one. Through Ezekiel, the Lord... Oh, sorry, the, another one coming up. He's giving some background here. Through Ezekiel, the Lord also tells of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon, which becomes the instrument in his hands to bring to pass the gathering of Israel. Of that day of gathering, he says, I will make them one nation in the land upon the mountains of Israel, and one king shall be king to them all. In that day, he promises to cleanse them by baptism, so shall they be my people. And I will be their God, and David my servant shall be king over them. And they all shall have one shepherd, and they shall also walk in my judgments, and observe my statutes, and do them. And they shall dwell in the land that I have given unto Jacob my servant, wherein your fathers have dwelt. And they shall dwell therein, even they and their children and their children's children forever. And my servant David shall be their prince forever." Then the Lord restates that his gathered people shall have his everlasting gospel with all its blessings, that he will set his sanctuary, meaning his temple, in their midst forevermore, as Zechariah recorded, and all Israel shall know that the Lord is their God, Ezekiel 37. How glorious shall be the coming day when the second David, who is Christ, reigns on the throne of the first David, when all men shall dwell safely when the earth shall be dotted with temples, and when the gospel covenant shall have full force and validity in all the earth. So that's from the book, The Promised Messiah. So this is amazing times. And that's what Isaiah 11 is talking about, is this is going to happen. Now the beauty is, is in our day and age now, this is in the middle of happening. So we are preparing for the coming of Christ. All right, this is super important. Now if you, if you go back and think, uh, and I know we've talked about this in some previous videos, dealing with the coming of Christ. If you think about how the church has changed their logo, what was the main logo the church used for a long, long time? Was Moroni blowing his trumpet. What's the point of Moroni blowing his trumpet? The point is he is announcing the coming of Israel, or of Christ, not Israel. We're preparing for Israel so that Christ can come. He is announcing the coming of Christ. So this is important. Now, since 1832, Moroni, when he met with Joseph Smith in Joseph Smith's bedroom that night, which is literally, the, as the recording of this, 200 years to the day of the recording of this video, this is really fun, uh, is when Moroni started that effort. So we've used that visual of Moroni proclaiming the gospel, announcing Christ is coming as the symbol of the, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints ever since then, until President Nelson became the prophet. Now he, under, under his tutelage as the prophet, we have changed to a, an image of the Savior coming. He is coming through a door. Now every temple has one unique thing about it that's, well not, it's unique to temples, but every single temple has this. That is a door on the east side of the temple. Now, usually Angel Moroni is facing to the east. 
because that is the direction the Savior will come. And that's not literally the direction the Savior will come, but that follows the, the ideas and concept that even Moses put together of the, the idea of direction. So if you want to see that, go look at our videos in Genesis and Moses to understand the whole idea of eastward and Eden kind of a concept and that Christ is going to come and get, see us at that time. The scriptures are like a puzzle. There's lots of little pieces and you have to go through the, all the pieces to pull the concepts together. So that's why we're taking some time to look into some of these things. So now we have the Savior appearing. The Savior is here. So we are moving beyond what Isaiah 11 is telling us. Is Isaiah 11 saying, here's what's going to happen. And we're saying, yep, that's happening right now. But we're preparing for the next phase, which is when the Savior comes. That is coming up. So we'll see what happens next week in the the October 2023 General Conference course. By the time you watch this, you'll be like, oh yeah, we already know what happened because this was recorded just before then. Uh, but yeah, some fun stuff. So I'm looking forward to your comments as we talk about this more. Now let's get back into Isaiah 11. Chap uh, verse verse uh, 6, basically, is where we want to be here. So verse 6, the wolf shall also dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall, dwell, shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them. So this is an, uh, this is really fascinating uh, imagery that we're getting here. A wolf shall dwell with the lamb. Wolves usually eat lambs. The leopard shall lie down with the kid, which is usually a goat, baby goat, the calf and the young lion, and the fatling together. So lions, calves, the cows, lions will eat the cows. So there's the, that whole idea of survival of the fittest, the law of the jungle is going to be done away with, basically. This idea, we're going to learn to get to get, get along better. There's some interesting ideas on this, though. Now, I have this here. This is from G.K. Chesterton in his uh, book on orthodoxy in the Bible. It is constantly assured that when the lion lies down with the lamb, the lion becomes lamb-like. But that is brutal annexation and imperialism on the part of the lamb. That is simply the lamb absorbing the lion instead of the lion eating the lamb. So what he's talking about here is not that the lion will suddenly become like a lamb. Because the lamb doesn't pursue the lion. And now we have the lion and the lamb not pursuing each other. This isn't the lion becoming like a lamb, meaning the lamb was the truth all the time and the lion was not the truth. But now the lion changes to be the truth. What he's saying here is, he says, the real problem is, the, can the lion lie down with the lamb and still remain his royal ferocity? That is the problem the church attempted. That is the miracle she achieved. So here's the thoughts, and Hugh Nibley talks about this a little bit more in some of his books. What would it take for the lamb and the lion to respect each other enough to allow them both to be their own individual selves but not hate or go against each other. That's the good thought. So what if the lamb can maintain its gentle docility, but the lion can also maintain its ferocity? Strength and weaknesses all rolled into one. So this is a great thing for us to think about. How can we have a situation? What is it going to take for society to be in a position where we end hate? Where we end contention, basically. But this doesn't mean, again, this isn't meaning that the lion suddenly stops wanting to eat meat and becomes a vegetarian. This means the lion is still the lion, but the, and the lamb is still the lamb, but they get along. They don't need to hate each other, hurt each other, or do things. They've learned a higher set of rules. They don't need to hurt each other to gain advantage. So if we think of this from a metaphorical standpoint, which it, which it is, this is all metaphorical. If you think about this from a standpoint of society, what would it take for the lions in society and the lambs in society to get along? To respect each other. To not interfere with each other. That's pretty cool. There are principles and concepts and ideas that we need to understand in the gospel. The, the gospel itself is what is going to bring this about. The principles of the gospel are going to bring this phenomenon about basically. The more we understand the gospel, the more we study it, the more we live it, 
the more these things will happen. This is really why I'm doing these videos is so that we can help more people learn so that we can get closer to that kind of a society. When the lions and the lambs of society can allow each other to be themselves, but still not fight. And they don't have to get one over the other. They allow each other to be, be themselves and respect each other. This is great. This is a great philosophy. So this is society-wise, this is what we want to look for. This is what we want to espouse. If we're looking for principles and values to put into place in society, these are the ones we want to work on. This is what's going to come about when Christ comes. Unfortunately, it'll probably take Christ coming again before this happens. Unfortunately, now in Zion, this can happen. This is where Zion is going to. Law of consecration, those kinds of principles are going in this very direction. So Zion has that potential. And as we prepare a people ready for Zion, that's what's going to happen. The beauty of all of this is, and President Gordon B. Hinckley made this comment. He says, we've all read Revelations. We all know how this world ends. The only question to be answered is, which side are you going to be on when it ends? So this is what Zion's all about is, are we willing to sacrifice the world to be a part of Zion? You can't be in the world and in Zion at the same time. You, at some point, those forces are going to pull on you and you're going to have to make a choice. Do I stay with the world or do I go with Zion? These are the things that you need to think about. This is what President Ballot talks about, the good ship Zion. Do not get out of the boat. Stay in the boat. Stay with us going to Zion. It's going to be a better situation than if you don't. And we're going to learn more about that here in a little bit too, what happens to them. So this is the idea. This is what everything is about. Abraham 325, it's all about, are you going to follow the world's philosophy or Zion philosophy? This is your choice, the ultimate choice you have in your life to be thinking about. And we're getting darn close to where that separation is. We're already separating. The wheat and the tares are already being separated. This is already happening. The sifting is happening. And now it's just, a, again, it's a question of when it all comes to an end, which side are you going to want to be on? So that's a decision you have to make. And sooner you make it, the better. So this is important. Now, the other thing to think about these concepts is realize is that Christ is the lion of God and the lamb of God. So he's the champion of Israel, the one who's defending and supporting Israel. And he is also the lamb, the sacrifice, so that Israel can live again. He's both of those features, which is really kind of a cool way to think about it. Now verse 7. The cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. So that's continuing the same metaphor, basically. And again, this doesn't mean that the lion is suddenly vegetarian. It means the lion has learned how to get along. Verse, seven, uh, verse 8, And the sucking child shall play on the hole of the asp, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. Now, this is something for us to think about here, too. And the asp, okay, is a horned viper. It's a, it's a kind of a snake that has horns on it that is poisonous. So if you, if a child, a sucking child means a child who's still breastfeeding. So this is a child probably within, within no older than five years, probably three years or younger. That child puts their hand up on the, the hole, the, the, the cavity between the rocks where that snake is hiding and the snake doesn't bite him. The snake doesn't feel threatened, basically. And the weaned child, so this is a child who's no longer breastfeeding, but is now eating solid food, shall put his hand on the cockatrice's den. Now, a cockatrice is, in today's world, cockatrice, or cockatrice, we would think maybe a bird. Like, why does that be a bad thing? But actually, it's a venomous serpent in Old Testament times. So again, these are serpents that hide, lie in wait, and then strike and poison. And they are going to not be threatened by a child. Innocents, will, will, they won't take advantage of those innocents, basically. Now, all these animals that we've just talked about should be enemies, but they learn to be themselves and allow others to be themselves too. Consider the age of the animals. It's young animals or new generations that learn to grow up, understanding how to live in peace. This is it. So there's generations that need to kind of work their way through 
to allow these to come in. Are the young children today one of these new generations that are going to learn this? We don't know. Maybe. That could be interesting. Now, another way to look at this is the fall is seen as a snake trying to destroy the child of a woman. If you go back to Adam and Eve, the creation stories, we see that imagery there as well. Now, they are not fighting. So that's just kind of bringing the war in heaven to an end, kind of a deal with the peace and opportunities. Uh, so it, it is, it, you know, when you look at the millennium, it's a bit of a temporary peace because the end of millennium is when, when it finally ends, just before everything's done. Now verse 9, They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Very important, very, very important point for us to look at. So here's something that's important to think about. There's a lot of things we learn in this life that only pertain to mortality. So if you do not hurt or destroy, there's no need for industrial military complexes. There's no need for fighting. There's hardly a need for weapons. So self-defense is important. I think self-defense is a good thing to learn. But realize at some point, it's not going to be needed. It's not the most important thing we should learn in life, is how to take somebody else's life. It's not bad to learn, and unfortunately we live in a world where self-defense is somewhat of a necessary evil, but it's not the main thing to learn. Understanding Christ and understanding his gospel is more important. So that's, that's kind of a good metaphor we get from verse 9. Now also, Orson Pratt had something to say about this. He said, the knowledge of God will then cover the earth as the waters cover the mighty deep. There will be no place of ignorance, no place of darkness, no place for those that will not serve God. Why? Because Jesus, the great creator and also the great redeemer, will be himself on the earth. And his holy angels will be on the earth. And all the resurrected saints that have died in former dispensations will all come forth. And they will be on the earth. What a happy earth this creation will be when this purifying process shall come and the earth be fulfilled, be filled with the knowledge of God as the waters cover the great deep. What a change. Travel then from one end of the earth to another. You can find no wicked man, no drunken man, no man to blaspheme the name of the great creator, no one to lay hold on his neighbor's goods and steal them, no one to commit whoredoms, for all who commit whoredoms will be thrust down to hell, saith the Lord God Almighty. And all persons who commit sin will be speedily visited by the judgments of the Almighty. That's volume 21 of the Journal of Discourses where you can find that. So the knowledge of God is going to be everywhere. And again, this is, if you think about it, the, there is, while we talk about you know, resurrection and judgment, if you think of the plan of salvation, resurrection and judgment happen after the spirit world idea there is a bit of a prejudgment in the resurrection in that the first resurrection started with Christ and sort of is happening still to this day. The first resurrection will be the people who are taken up to come with Christ in power in his glorious second coming. That's the wrapping up of that first resurrection. The wicked, the people who haven't repented and who haven't used the atonement fully in their life, are the ones that are going to be wiped out. So not a lot of humans are going to be left. We're going to have a lot of righteous people. The righteous are going to outweigh anybody else. Now, people still be born. People still be living and doing things on this earth for another thousand years. And so there'll be new spirits brought in. They are going to have that experience of being tested and tried, good and evil, those kinds of things. Uh, and that's going to come in at the end of the millennium. Uh, fourth Nephi, basically. So as we look into those things, just realize, again, righteous is going to be here, wicked's not. They're going to be thrust to hell. So this is, there's three versions of hell, three ways that the definitions you can use of hell I've learned in the scriptures. And so a lot of it's spirit prison. They're going to have to go deal with their own sins and, and suffer that, basically, because they can't be with Christ. Christ is on the earth, so they can't necessarily be here. Uh, so a lot of crazy things are going to be happening. Now, another thing to think about here is when it talks about this, the, full, the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. So here's a question. Can water cover the sea? I mean, the sea is water. Can water cover water? 
sounds kind of strange to think about water on top of water. You know, the water covering the sea. So here's something to think about. This is not a surface level thing. This isn't just something on top of the sea. This is thorough, basically. Thoroughly understanding Christ. Deep, thorough understanding. Our relationship with Christ is the number one most important thing. And that's so important for us to always understand. Okay, That's what the gospel is about. The gospel is a tool to help us gain a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's what it's about. Baptism opens the door to a more closer relationship with Christ. Following his commandments help us to come closer with Christ. All the ordinances help us come closer to Christ. As we build our relationship with Christ, we will improve our spirituality and understanding much better. And the atonement can have more of an effect in our life. So that's a very, very important point as they're talking about this. Now in verse 10, we're going to get back to this idea of the root of Jesse, some of these metaphors again. And in that day, there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and rest shall be and his rest shall be glorious. So here's something that's interesting on this one is his is the term for the enzyme. The enzyme is going to be a man and it's singular, basically. Now if we look in here, uh, verse 5 of section 113, it says, What is the root of Jesse spoken of in the 10th verse of the 11th chapter of Isaiah? Behold, thus saith the Lord, it is a descendant of Jesse, as well as of Joseph, unto whom rightly the priest belongs the priesthood, and the keys of the kingdom, for an ensign, and for the gathering of my people in the last days. This is who we would call a prophet. So Joseph Smith, in a way, is the beginning of this, this ensign. But it's we're dealing with prophets in this at this point, basically. So with that, let's see, I think I had another quote here. Oh yes, another thing to think about in this is, uh, well, let, let, me, let me do this. I mean, before I move on to that, I was going to talk about an enzyme is a flag. I guess we'll talk about this real quick, because this, this still ties in. An enzyme is a flag. So when armies march, when in the ancient worlds, when kingdoms would, would march and go places, there would always be a flag with them. Even on cars, for diplomats and dignitaries today, there are their nation flags on them. That is the standard bearer idea, basically. So that's what an ensign is, is this is the flag, this is the marker to tell you how to go. So we think of construction flaggers uh, or other people like that, they're giving us direction and guidance. That's what an ensign is. So flags are not the destination, but point to the destination we should go. So the ensign not only is a prophet, but also the organization of the ensign of the of the church. Okay? That's so Article Faith 5 and 6 come into play here basically. And this is what's important is the church is not the destination, but it is the flag that points us to the destination. Like we just learned about previously, our relationship with Jesus Christ is the number one most important thing. The church is a tool to help us get there. That is the important point about it. this is why church is important, is it helps us to get there. We ultimately still have to make the choice to get there. That's, that's the thing we have to always understand. That's our responsibility. Regardless of the church, we have to get ourselves to Christ. And that's what we should always be focusing on, is moving ourselves towards Christ in everything we do. Now here's a quote from Joseph Fielding Smith describing the enzyme and its significance. He says, Over 125 years ago, in the little town of Fayette, Seneca County, New York, the Lord set up an enzyme to the nations. It was in fulfillment of the prediction made by the prophet Isaiah, which I have read. That's the one we're in Isaiah chapter 11. Uh, that enzyme was the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which was established for the last time, never again to be destroyed or given to other people. It was the greatest event the world has seen since the day that the Redeemer was lifted up upon the cross and worked out the infinite and eternal atonement. It meant more to mankind than anything else that has occurred since that day. Following the raising of this ensign, the Lord sent forth his elders clothed, clothed with the priesthood and with power and authority among the nations of the earth, bearing witness unto all peoples of the restoration of his church. 
and calling upon the children of men to repent and receive the gospel. For now it was being preached in all the world as a witness before the end should come, that this, that is, the end of the reign of wickedness and of the establishment of the millennial reign of peace. The elders went forth as they were commanded and are still preaching the gospel and gathering out from the nations the seed of Israel unto whom the promises was, the promise was made. It's Doctrine of Salvation, Volume 3. So this is very important for us to think about, is this enzyme, the church, combined with priesthood. So Article Faith 5, we have priesthood. Now the priesthood, there's authority to act in the name of God. We have an organization that's purpose is to help administer the Article of Faith number 4, basically really the first four, teach the first four at scale. So the organization is here to help us to scale up and to administer the ordinances of things at a scale that is doable at a global level, basically. That's what the church is for. The church is not the end-all be-all. The church is a tool to make it easier for us to come to Christ. So always be working on coming to Christ. Super, super important. Now, one thing some people will say about this is, because it says in here, that is an enzyme of the people to it shall the Gentiles seek. So some people say, well, this doesn't mean Latter-day prophecy. The, here's the thing, though. The Gentiles didn't seek Christ when he was on the earth. We have, the, we have stories of one or two Gentiles, maybe, that, that sought Christ. But that's it. The Gentiles as a nation didn't seek Christ. So this is still a latter-day thing. This is missionary work, basically, that's happening here. So let's move on to verse 11. And it shall come to pass in that day, usually when it says in that day, we're talking last days. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, which shall be left from Assyria and from Egypt, from Pathros and from Cush, from Elam and from Shinar and from Hamath and from the islands of the sea. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations and shall assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. Now I read 11 and 12 together for one important reason. These are the two verses that 200 years ago tonight on September 21st that Moroni recited to Joseph Smith in his room. So these are the ones that he said. These that he said, and Moroni told him, these are about to be fulfilled. So this is the prepare, the beginning of the gathering of Israel and the commencement of the second coming of the Savior is that is the message he was pronouncing. Because Moroni gave Joseph Smith these two verses is why Moroni is on the temples. This is why he's there. He is pronouncing it is time for the next phase of God's plan to come together. That was the restoration of the gospel, and we are continuing that. In fact, we're getting pretty darn close to getting to the other, a momentous occasion, if not to the other side of that gathering. So we're getting really close on that, which is really important. Now, it's important to realize, too, when we think about, about this, Christ didn't gather Israel in his day and age. There wasn't a gathering back then. In fact, it was being scattered, basically. So it hasn't been the last 50 to 100 years that they're scattering, the, the, the gathering has actually been taking place, basically. So it hasn't been long since this has happened. Uh, it's still relatively young in, in its concepts when you think of the age of, of everything else. But this is where we're at today. This is missionary work. This is the efforts we're putting forward today. So very, very important. So... Uh, as we look at this, let's jump to uh, verse 13, and we're going to continue forward here. So verse 13, the envy also of Ephraim shall depart, and the adversaries of Judah shall be cut off. Ephraim shall not envy Judah, and Judah shall not vex Ephraim. Now Ephraim, in this context, are the tribes the Ephraim became kind of the predominant tribe. So this is this is somewhat poetic in here. If you remember back, we, we learned when you get back into Kings and Chronicles in that area, that 
the nation of Israel split into two nations. There is the northern kingdom, which is ten tribes. Then there was the southern kingdom, which was two tribes. Those tribes were Judah and Benjamin. And Judah was by far the more prominent one, and they were the ones around the city of Jerusalem. So when, you, when we talk about Judah, we're oftentimes talking about Judah and Benjamin, the people that the Israelites that lived in and around Jerusalem. When we use the word Ephraim, especially in Isaiah, it's talking about the, the northern tribes. So the northern tribes, Ephraim, the tribe of Ephraim kind of became the leaders of, of the northern tribes. Basically, the northern tribes went into idolatry and fell apart, so they got led astray. So in the last days, Ephraim is going to bring them back. They, they unfortunately facilitated through wickedness, the scattering, but then God is going to use Ephraim to bring them back. Another descendants, ancestry of Ephraim was going to bring them back in the last days. So kind of cool how we see that come together there. So historically, Ephraim and Judah have been enemies. Now, if you've, if you've followed our videos, the last couple of videos, we talked about the uh, Ephro-Syria Syria war with Judah. Remember, Ephraim sided with Syria to basically stop Assyria they wanted Judah to fight with them, and Judah said, no, we're not going to. And so they came and attacked him, and it turned into a big mess, and, and Judah won, basically. Um, so they're, they hit each other, but in the last days, they will work together. So very important. So Isaiah 9.21, uh, not, not 9.21, but Isaiah chapter 9, verse 21. That's another area where this kind of comes in. Uh, the brothers hated each other. Again, that's that, these, that uh, the war that they had. So now they're getting along. Elder Legrand Richards explained how this prophecy must be fulfilled. He said, we are from Ephraim. The Lord expects us, since we are the custodians of his gospel and res as restored in these latter days, according to my understanding, to extend the hand of friendship to Judah. Because after all, we are all descendants of the prophets, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and we come under the promises that through their descendants should all the nations of the earth be blessed. I do not know how the enmity and the envy between Ephraim and Judah can disappear, except that we of the house of Ephraim, who have the custody of the gospel, should lead out in trying to bring to this branch of the house of Israel the blessings of the restored gospel. And it seems to me that the only way that the tribe of Judah can be sanctified to dwell in his presence forever and ever will be when we bring to them the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ as the Savior promised. Promised them it would be brought in the latter days. That's his conference report in October of 1956 when uh, Elder Richard said that. So they're coming together, basically the northern kingdom, the southern kingdom, coming together to be Zion, basically. Verse 14, But they shall fly upon the shoulders of the Philistines toward the west. They shall spoil them of the east together. They shall lay their hand upon Edom and Moab, and the children of Ammon shall obey them. So there's a lot of symbology in here. Now, if just, just to kind of go back and think about this, is in back in verse 11, he talks about how they will be left from Assyria and from Egypt, from Pathros, Cush, Elam, Shinar. So they're talking about at the known world, they're going to be scattered through the known world, and then they're going to be gathered out of the known world back. So these are more representative of the context of what they knew of the world at the time, basically. Now, verse 14, though, we get in here talking about flying upon the shoulders of the Philistines. So what this is, the, the, if you go back to the Hebrew translation of the Bible, fly down on the shoulders or basically attack the western slopes that were Philistine territory. So Ephraim and Judah together, they shall spoil. So they're going to come together and destroy the nations that hate Israel. And they're fighting against Israel, basically. Uh, Edom and Moab and the children of Ammon shall obey them. Now, this is important because Edom and Moab are the descendants of Lot. So they are cousins to Israel. And they will eventually obey Israel and work with them, basically. Uh, verse 15, And the Lord shall utterly destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea, and with his mighty wind shall he shake his hand over the river shall smite it in the seven streams and make men go over dry shod. And there shall be an highway for the remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria, like as it was to Israel in the day when he came up out of the land of Egypt. Now, Elder Wilford Woodruff summarized this 
this concept here in the spirit of this gathering in light of Isaiah's words when he said, Isaiah's soul seemed to be on fire and his mind wrapped in the visions of the Almighty while he declared in the name of the Lord that it should come to pass in the last days that God should set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people, assemble the outcasts of Israel, gather together the dispersed of Judah, destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea, and make men go over dry shod, gather them to Israel on horses, mules, swift beasts, and in chariots, and rebuild Jerusalem upon her own heaps, while at the same time the destroyer of the Gentiles will be on his way. And while God was turning the captivity of Israel, he would put all their curses and afflictions upon the heads of the Gentiles, their enemies, who had not sought to recover but to destroy them, and had not trodden them underfoot from generation to generation. At the same time, the standard should be lifted up that the honest in heart, the meek of the earth among the Gentiles, should seek unto it, and that Zion should be redeemed and be built up a holy city, that the glory and power of God should rest upon her and be seen upon her, that the watchmen upon Mount Ephraim might cry, Arise ye, and let us go up unto Zion, the city of the Lord our God, that the Gentiles might come to her light, and kings to the brightness of her rising that the saints of God may have a place to flee to and stand in holy places while judgment works in the earth, that when the sword of God that is bathed in heaven falls upon Idumea or the world, when the Lord pleads with all flesh by sword and by fire and the slain of the Lord are many, the saints may escape these calamities by fleeing to the places of refuge, like Lot and Noah. This comes from the History of the Church, volume 6, page 26. So this is happening now. This is all happening in our day and age right now. So Isaiah chapter 11 is super profound for us. So we know there's still destruction coming. There's still a lot of wars and pestilences and problems that are coming that are going to lay waste the cities, destroy the nations, break everything down so that the Savior can come again. It's crazy to think about, but the abomination and desolations will happen again. It's all going to happen as we prepare. But here's the beauty of the whole situation. As we follow Christ, as we seek to stand in holy places, we can be saved. What is a holy place? A lot of times people talk about temples as a holy place. So building of temples, getting to 1,500 temples means there will be a holy place easily accessible to everybody on the planet. When you think of how many temples there are all over the world right now, if you look at a world map, how many temples there are, that's a lot, and that's only around 165 some odd temples. 1,500 temples. If that quote is true from Elder Pearson, we got a lot of work ahead of us. And it is preparing for exactly what Isaiah 11 is talking about, which is Article of Faith number 10. Basically, it's pulling all this together. So this is what we have in store for us. This is what it's all about to help us out. So I know this video is coming out mid-December. So this is a great time of year as we focus on Christ. To think about this, to think about Christ and how can we prepare ourselves to be in his presence and how can we help the world to be ready for when he comes again as well. I hope you're enjoying these videos. I know this was a long one. We had a lot to talk about in here. So packed, so amazing of what's in this chapter. Read this chapter, understand this chapter, because it is in literal fulfillment in our day and age today. But let's jump over to the next chapter as we continue forward on just some of this amazing stuff that Isaiah is telling us.